have significant materials relevant to the people's lives. Students who go up to high school, university level, step by step, eventually start to detach themselves from the knowledges, experiences, traditions, cultural practices, and so on of the people. That's epistemic alienation, or that alienation is the first experience, usually not presented, because there is hope within it. We're hoping that we are civilizing. We're hoping that we're doing great, we're going to bring civilization from the West, because now we're able to speak in English. We are, speak to, we are able to write. But the frustration comes when a lot of the students are unable to meet their dreams after finishing that system, doing that system. There are no enough or satisfying jobs by graduating from the education system. And in the process of education, instead of helping students to be equipped to solve problems, the education system becomes a kind of metaphysical reality that is imposed upon students who are struggling with a foreign language to understand its content, to pass its exams, in order to simply become alienated beings that are neither part of their community nor the civilized world. So this inability to realize one's dream, one's desire through education, leads to the second stage of alienation, which means double alienation. Unable to be part of tradition, unable to be part of modernization or civilization, or whatever you call it. This in betweenness this, uh, uh, this alienation makes students vulnerable to all kinds of uh, issues, including uh, radicalism, including hopelessness, including the inability to uh, really respectfully and uh, culturally understand each other and address issues. So that is, that is one of the most important outcomes that I think uh, I found. But the question is, why did this happen? Why do we have such a system that alienates the students from their tradition, Ethiopian tradition, literature, culture, all of you study, you understand it, you, have, you understand what Ethiopia has, the ways of knowledge Ethiopia has, is important for the world. So why is this happening was another reason why I was interested uh, in studying and writing this book. And I think one of the problem within Ethiopia, and the reason why I call it colonialism, is because it has some link with other parts of the world. We all know Ethiopia was not physically colonized by uh, uh, Western countries. Colonization being the internalization of the existence of a superior power in your own country. That never happened in Ethiopia. Ethiopia has never bowed to foreign powers. But epistemic colonization came into Ethiopia through various means or the notion of modernization. And as we all know, there is, I think, a very important distinction that I want to make between colonialism and colonization. Colonization is simply a physical occupation of a place by a foreign power. It's time bound, it starts when the foreign power comes in, and it ends when that foreign power goes out. Colonialism involves the internalization of coloni colonization, a superior power in in terms of knowledge, in terms of people's understanding of time, people's understanding of themselves, their own identity, their own place in the world. That type of colonization could work through knowledge or epistemic violence, violence based on knowledge, a violence that degrades people's experiences, that tells them that whatever you know is meaningless because you don't know best, a violence that has happened all over Africa, especially by Europeans who were looking for ideas that would reinforce, that would help them understand themselves better by turning a lot of African indigenous knowledges as simply resources, objects that can freely be appropriated and used to interpret their own idea of the world. That type of violence happened in, in Ethiopia through the systems and institutions that Ethiopia created for a long time. And um, uh, we, and I, I, can, I can do or provide some explanations to that uh, later if you have some questions. But the most important point is that, you know, 
is peace in colonization, which is a colonization of people's ways of understanding the world, and understanding themselves, and understanding reality. When colonialism happened, one of, one of the important points why colonialism is persistent, not just in Ethiopia, but in other parts of the world, is the colonized people, when they were colonized, they accepted, they were told that their past was or resembles like the past of the Europeans. You know, your past is like our past. If you do what we tell you in education, in development, in this, in that, you will become like us. Your present is our past. If you do the right thing, your future will become our present. That is a formula that disposes people their past as well as their future. Their past is told to them through the stories that have been, you know, dominant, the epistemologies that are dominant across uh, universities, across the world. They are told to understand their past as interpreted and told to them within this global hierarchy of knowledge, which I can explain a bit later. And their future, their dream is also to become like others. Because of that, they lose their past. They don't have their own way of interpreting their past. They don't have their own way of imagining the future. And this happened in Ethiopia uh, through what we know, what we call the process of modernization. And I try to locate the historical sites where this type of colonialism started in Ethiopia. Colonialism, not colonization, because there's no physical occupation of the place. Colonialism, the ideological, the epistemological, the mental colonization of uh, uh, Ethiopian landscape of knowledge, or the, inter the interpretation of how Ethiopia uh, has been done for, for a very long time now. And I try to interpret Ethiopia's indigenous ways of understanding, because as, as I tried to mention uh, earlier, my work very much focuses on epistemology. Knowledge that organize, that interpret, that guide other knowledges. You know, we can have a very good skill in writing something or talking about some place, but most knowledges or almost all knowledges have got certain epistemic or epistemological principles. Principles like how do we understand reality? What is the purpose of knowledge? What is the relationship between good and evil? What, what, what type of identities individuals should have in society? These type of epistemological questions, some of the metaphysical questions, are important in guiding the purpose, the content of other knowledge. So I'm talking about these high-level principles that guide the reason why knowledge is produced in Ethiopia. And these are the knowledge that are, that are Western Eurocentric knowledges, uh, which, which is part of how you know, the rest of Africa has been uh, understood. Uh, for example, you can, you can refer it to, uh, some, sometimes it's called Eurocentrism. Uh, you can refer it to the idea of uh, Africans having no history. If they have some history, it must have been brought somewhere else. They can't really develop their own history. They can't have their own civilization. If Africans have literature, it must have come from somewhere. That notion, a Hegelian notion, for example, of understanding history as a continuation and development and becoming fruitful, history being, or Europe being the center of history, places like Africa being out of history. And Ethiopia's history has been dismissed minimized, reduced, sometimes ignored, sometimes selectively appropriated to justify this type of narrative. So these are mechanisms through which Ethiopians are unable to, re to, to view a vision of knowledge that can be realized through their ignorance, <coughs> including the inability to question why I was studying in English in a country where I wouldn't, I wouldn't practice it because I believe English is like, you know, opening the doors of heaven. <laughs> yeah, so that, that type of epistemic colonization is very important. And historically, I believe uh, uh, that emerged, uh, especially since I tried to focus on since the period of Theodros. But uh, for the period before Theodros, I try to kind of generally present two important at least principles that would help us understand 
the type of indigenous perspectives Ethiopia has had in terms of interpreting the world and also pursuing knowledge. One is, of course, the notion of covenant, for example. The notion that Ethiopia is a covenant land. Now, the problem with some of the ways in which we understand Ethiopia emerges from two sources. One is the notion of traditionalism, a notion that tries to either romanticize or present as barbaric Ethiopian content, as Ethiopian ideals. The second one is globalism, by, by creating a kind of a global system to which Ethiopians can belong. If we set aside these two challenges and try to understand how Ethiopians wrote the Kibra legacy, how Ethiopians were producing knowledge in the past, and in, in other, in other uh, uh, traditions as well, we can find that there is this sense that Ethiopia is an important place. And the second one is the understanding of wisdom, or knowledge itself. What is the purpose of knowledge? Humbling oneself, humility, for example, is a very important epistemic or a very important epistemic principle that really helps Ethiopians uh, produce knowledge. Knowledge is not a property of an, an individual, it's a gift of God. In the same way, the air, heaven, earth, life is given to us, we've also given knowledge. And the duty of a person is to present knowledge and to share it with others, not to make it their own property. And, uh, uh, and distribute it to others as, for, for, as a source of power for themselves. But historically, when I try to examine, especially because, as you may, you, you may all know, Theodros committed suicide at Maglela when the British came. And that symbolically, at least, presented to Ethiopia the existence of an external gaze, gaze a European gaze, that has its own interest to, uh, to uh, impose its will upon the country. Uh, in the book, I'm jumping from chapters to chapters, but I, I hope you'll ask any questions to clarify if, if there are questions. Uh, so that was important, starting from that period. In Ethiopia, there was this consciousness, I think, that people felt that they have to respond in some way towards this European gaze. The period of Johannes, for example, was a period when the emperor was trying to reinforce his internal power base. The period of Minilik was a kind of delicate balance, keeping that balance between the West, the, the Europeans, and the desire of the country to remain independent, to become the, the trade line between enmity and friendship. And of course, the period of Haile Selassie changed a lot of things. Uh, in terms of accepting uh, the civilization of the West as the destiny of the country. Education was entirely in English, starting from elementary. There was no content in the education system that relates to people's experience. Students were educated in order to teach lead their people without knowing the culture of the people. You have to show me time if I'm finishing here. So, what happened? As a result of that, is students who were going to the school in Ethiopia were, did not have this epistemological, as I told you before, those knowledge that guide, that organize the purpose of knowledge, the purpose of education in the country. They haven't had intimate relationship with their own traditions. They didn't know why they were studying. They thought whatever they know from outside, from anywhere, would be useful for the country. And undeniably, Ethiopia was economically a very poor country. It existed, isolated from the world. As you know, European foreign policy, all types of policy was racist towards black people. Because of that, no European country was taking Ethiopia seriously as a friend. The lamenting of Ethiopian kings writing to their Christian brothers in Europe to help them, read them and read what type of responses they got. Because Ethiopia was not regarded as part of a civilized, a civilized world. It's a barbaric, backward world. All it needs is colonizer soldiers or missionaries who teach them, or who, who, who teach them the gospel. So that was the European mentality toward this, toward this uh, race. 
So it was, of course, encircled. It is border, it's outlet to the eastern parts of the world, was also encircled. Pretty much the world was colonized by Europeans to a large extent. And this is a country with diverse ethnicities that has that was able to maintain itself. But that isolation had its own significant cost. So the poverty of the country was not related to its historical existence. People never told Ethiopians that there is such a thing called hierarchy of races in the world. 18th, 19th century, as you all know, scientific racism was part of university. Education was decided on the basis of race. It was believed that Africans cannot understand any knowledge about year four. So Africans were not allowed to study about that. All colonial education policies were made by the colonizers to teach the colonized people their own language and to reduce them into subhumans so that they could go and save them. Colonization itself was seen as a holy enterprise, a holy act to save the savages from their backwardness. So within this dominant epistemological framework that was part of European history and culture towards other races, the only knowledge that they have about places like Ethiopia was through missionaries, people who go to the country who don't even speak the language, but were able to appropriate what they saw and interpret it in their own country so that makes sense to their own audience. That was given to Ethiopians as a source of knowledge. So that was critical in inculcating, in developing a type of identity among Ethiopian students, early Ethiopian students. That identity is critical in changing the life of the nation in terms of knowledge. Almost every student who went through the school without learning anything about Ethiopia believed that they are superior to their own people. Believed that they can civilize them. I divide their identity as messianism and missionaryism. Missionaryism is this tendency to preach others without even knowing their experience. How can you talk about people you have never met? How can you change a place you have never been to? How can you really describe present the story of people you have never seen? Because of this European peace knowledge, because that starts from Descartes, that, that's another, another, another uh, area. That knowledge, that Orientalist literature, was used to interpret Ethiopians as well. Ethiopians were pre presented either as extinction of the Semite people in, in, in South Yemen. They are sometimes presented as uh, uh, you know, people who are Caucasians when uh, Ethiopians defeated Italy at the battle, you know. Uh, newspapers in America presented, oh, Ethiopians are Caucasians, by the way, they're not black. So this epistemological domination, knowledge domination by the West, was used to interpret Ethiopian experience. And a lot of Ethiopians, I'm sorry to say this, become part of that package in presenting Ethiopia as something that has some interesting things, but nonetheless, something whose experience is not remote from what we already know. So, messianism and missionarism is this tendency to preach others about their experience without experiencing and understanding their knowledge. But telling them like the gospel, in the same way the gospel gives people the power to go and convert others so that they go to heaven. Western interpretation of history and knowledge was taken as a gospel. So that everybody, even if their experience is unknown, is simply regarded as the past of Europeans. In the same way Europe has this feudal past experience. Ethiopian history was presented to students as feudalism. Traditional leaders were seen as enemies, reactionaries. So when Ethiopians learn that, some of them become simply missionaries who talk to their people that they have to change. Others become messiah, uh, 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 become active change agents, which I call messianism. Messianism is, is, is something to represent the desire to change the people, if necessary, by 
through violence. The desire to change the system by using violence if necessary. The missionary tendency that Western education creates among Ethiopians is the desire to preach them. Look, this type of education is important. This type of development is important. Something that is not part of the people's experience is presented to them as valid, as important. To become messianic is related to the Ethiopian student movement. It's very much an idea that uh, was very much uh, uh, propagated by individuals who are completely alienated, inculcated, brought. Another, not necessarily uh, uh, Ameri Euro-American, but more of an Eastern, marxist leninist type of ideology. And they try to import it upon the population. Yes. Okay. So that, that, was, that was very critical. Because of that, when students are alienated from their tradition, when they believe that what they have in mind is so important, some of them wanted to really act violently to change the system. Ethiopian students have had a lot of clubs, parties, and so on, but they have had very little understanding about each other. Look at the content of their discourse. It's all full of ideas that are borrowed from foreign sources, from Marxism, from Leninism, and so on. They never really talked about the languages and the experience of their own people. And that resulted in violence. A culture of violence that doesn't change by changing governments. Because it has become part of the frame of thinking that Ethiopians has. It's not on the base of Tertena, as it was this. You know, traditionally, Tetanam means a person becomes knowledgeable in order to have the capacity to lower himself or herself. That is the reason why people study. That's the reason why when you want to go to play a bit sometimes, the teacher comes and washes your feet as a sign of respect. Knowledge is not something that puts you on top of people. It's actually something that would allow you, make you able to lift those who are at the bottom. So that is not the epistemological drive that Ethiopian students have in, in relation to their own people. Of course, there is other actors. There are other actors, global actors. I have mentioned before how Western knowledge epistemologically influences Ethiopia. Knowledge, it's not only knowledge, but also there are institutions that play part in perpetuating the type of colonial dominance that exists in Ethiopia. Look at how education policy is made in Ethiopia. You see, in 1972, I'm talking about with the European calendar, because I'm talking in English, Emperor Haile Selassie tried to introduce a reform and tried to change the medium of instruction into the, local, the country's language. And one of the reasons why Ethiopian students were so angry at the emperor was because they felt that they are going to be changed, reduced into the inferior status of their own people. He's going to make us like tenants by teaching us in Amharic instead of in English. So you can see that the alienation has become part of part of them. And these policies have been dominant in many parts of Africa, not just in Ethiopia. Neoliberal policy making, as we all understand, there is this standardized education systems. A teacher in South Africa teaches Ethiopian students, in rural Ethiopian students including, through satellite television in English. And that is celebrated as, oh, bringing technology to the poor. So, but the content, because people don't understand what a South African is talking in English when the, when the teacher opens the television and closes it as in, asks the questions. There's nothing. There's not even time to discuss. So policy making, I can't really go in detail on here, but it's important to remember that policy making is part of the other leg of colonialism. You have knowledge colonialism. You have also structural colonialism. That is part of influencing policies, uh, uh, and so on. Africans tried to change that in the 90s cases when they tried to Africanize the curriculum, but nobody supported them. 
later we all understand education for all yeah the education for all agenda which sounds very beautiful but nobody really asks whose education should be for all in whose language should education be distributed so because of these two things ethiopia continues to be dominated under western structural and epistemological power i will finish by saying just one last point then what should we do i think it's impossible to give a prescription but i think it's important to start to ask this question whatever privilege we get to read and write about ethiopia our privilege is not as important as the truth it's important it's hard but it's hard for us because our privilege our education is built on the base of this colonial dominance but it's not hard for the people some of them say oh it's very difficult how can you go back to the, to, to their tradition going back is progress going back to the people's knowledge to the people's language is progress staying away is colonialism you know one of the things that worries me is if we don't do this this civilization this knowledge that we are proud of in ethiopia will always remain as some kind of relic western countries do not simply go to africa to exploit natural resources they also exploit cultural resources knowledge I remember once when we used to work in in, in Addis uh I had a friend a Pisco uh American friend who came there to teach and I was very young at that time and I I like to play with him I want to touch his hair I want to hug him like this and go with him and he would freak out and say don't touch me don't touch me it's not nice what's the problem I want to touch you come on I I, I never understood that Another person came once said oh Ethiopians really love each other they go they must some a lot of them must be gay <laughs> <laughs> because that is a epistemological framework someone coming to Ethiopia and seeing the depth of connection people have may misunderstand it and may interpret it to give meaning to their own experiences when i heard a book about one of the peoples that's what came to my mind if we don't critically question this tomorrow we will be told that kebran agas is not your test book it was written by foreigners we may be told that this resource that you have has because because we are dominated under the epistemology we will not be able to question the validity others impose and distribute it to the world about the importance of our knowledge i will stop there and you can ask me any question thank you Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Many thanks for, you, for this uh, engaging presentation of your know, topics. I think I'm sure that we have uh, reactions and questions. Yes. So, so I, the, I would only ask to be short because so then we can have, uh, let's say, uh, a certain number of different voices. So please ask short questions. I will answer. <laughs> <laughs> What about uh, the now the the Chinese influence was is coming into the country. It's again changing things. Okay. Do I respond to each question or you want me to come? Maybe we can collect the three or two or three so, together. And, and yes. So your last point so what should be done mm -hmm. that's very important for me to know exactly yeah. what you think in Ethiopia because we have our own Ethiopian school system Ethiopian curriculum Ethiopian knowledge Ethiopian thinking and you should explicitly uh, recommend that explore that because this is the center of Ethiopian studies when we want to study and know explore give me job here <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, very quickly. The Chinese influence. Yes. But it will not stop this China. It will continue. Yes. Whoever comes with power, with resources, will have an open access. Why? Because within the country, we have destroyed the country's internal strengths in terms of ideas, vision, values. We have internalized these values, economic values, for example. That, you know, uh, I don't want to, to engage in a philosophical debate on values. We believe values are not internal to the individual. We don't believe in a homo economicus person, an individual motivated to just consume and exploit the world. We're not like that. We believe place, like the covenant, like the tower of every village. We think those places are important. We obey mechanic and the a place blesses human being. Human beings are placed by the are here by itself. Is God is a place of play. Uh, God is uh, God is a God of place by His capacity to carry the world. He is a place for the world. So that that type of notion is important because we don't have that. Whoever comes will continue to do that. So the Chinese influence is not surprising. What should be done? I can't give explicit recommendations, not because I don't want to, and not also because I believe it's not appropriate, even if I strongly feel that I have a solution, I can only present it for dialogue. You know, one of the problems is we sometimes associate our identity with our knowledge. We feel like if our knowledge is attacked, we feel like we are attacked. That is when we use knowledge as a means of dominating others, as a means of being important. So the knowledge we have is for ourselves, not for others. But if we believe like our ancestors did, they never put their names even at the end of their writing, right? Because that belongs to the whole people. If we do that, we will become willing to change our ideas. If you have better ideas, I will be so happy also to change. So we need to have that dialogue. But there is a movement towards this, actually. In Ethiopia, the domination is so big, so heavy. In other parts of the world, because they have the experience of colonialism, they know what type of mentalities a lot of European institutions and you know, uh, knowledge producers have. They have history. They have a history of violence in their own countries. They, they can say, oh, no, 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 we, we, you are wrong. We have our own idea. But the problem is they don't have their idea because they are colonized and a lot of it has been lost. In Ethiopia, we continue to have that respect because we, we, we haven't had a physical, at least, violence record history, a reminder of the danger of exposing ourselves to the ideas of others. So that continues to happen. We can learn from other countries. We really need to start to think about decolonizing, and the decolonization with paraphrase, because that's the problems uh, of our experiences and, 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 and knowledges that we can have interact with ourselves. So dialogue is the only short answer, because that's, that's going to take us to a very long discussion. Okay. Um, my question is uh, on general view of your view of understanding about Ethiopia. Uh, normally, I'll share some of your views about Ethiopian traditional education, but uh, <coughs> today is Ethiopia is different. Mm -hmm. I think you realize that uh, uh, ethnic federalism introduced. Uh, since 1991. Following the introduction of this ethnic federalism, the educational policy is already totally changed. Mm. So, uh, in your view, uh, strongly you argue that traditional education is important, we have to uh, uh, revive our traditional education, even these days, youngsters after 1991. In different regions, they do not claim that this traditional education is belong to that. So, how do you consider Ethiopia of today, in your view, just simply uh, dealing about uh, Eurocentrism of uh, mm. the so-called Western? Maybe, in my view, even uh, the educational policy of uh, imperial government pilot is by far, in some cases, better than this day. So Ethiopia is highly dominated, rather with an internal uh, socio-economic problems, uh, 
and uh, we have to we should not make our problem simply outside. And uh, the Ethiopian history is also totally from other African countries, is re relatively it's a far, far from Eurocentric view. So how you view is uh, really uh, uh, fit to Ethiopia of today since 1991. Mm. Have you said something? What do you mm. Thank you. Thank you, Solomon. Uh, <laughs> which part of Ethiopia you are talking about? <laughs> Thank you. That's a very <laughs> important question. Um, and if you present this presentation, the same question will be raised in Ethiopia. I understand. I understand. I understand. I mean, I wish I had an answer for all of the questions that you ask. It. These are the answers that we all have to search for. And my, my basic objective was to raise a fundamental question about Ethiopia and the ways in which Ethiopia is epistemologically, by knowledge, colonized, starting from especially the period of Haile Selassie, uh, 1960s. Because that's when, you know, you know, that's when the ideas become part of the institutions and people started to do something. So it's not only the idea of Western knowledge, but institutions are created. People are employed to implement those foreign and alien ideas that did not take into account the experience of the people. To make your question, your long question, very should provide some short answer. How do we define tradition? I feel that the problem is so complex because our way of looking at the problem by itself is a problem. Because we are centered, probably, probably, at the understanding of history I and mean, tradition in the same way now it's being presented to the people. You know, the notion of ethnic federalism as a project is starting at Isabel University, and the book explicitly talks about Walili Makunam's role in it. And I, have, I, I, I met actually a, a great Ethiopian historian in London and asked him, you know, you were a student at that time, what happened? And he said, we never slept for the whole night. This student just stood up in the middle and said that the fundamental Ethiopian problem is the domination of different ethnic groups. And they must be first independent. And later on, we have to come together. And we can achieve this only through violence. There's no other way. And they were so much. So that is, that is not something. That is another epistemology that is imposed upon the people. Of course, that has been realized now that people understand themselves ethnically by name, but not necessarily. The worry is not whether they are consistent with Gada, whether they are consistent with tradition. The worry is something else. Ethnicity has become another avenue for power, contesting power by Ethiopian elites. And I don't see, personally, from those who oppose or from those who are inside, in terms of epistemology, any hope yet that would take into account the people's existence. All of the questions center around urban problems, elite problems, not really very much about the daily lives of the rural people who are the majority. You know, we don't hear much how much rain was available to this time and how is the harvest now. We, hear, we don't hear how the farmers are struggling, what are the things with which they farm. The majority of Ethiopians are out of the discourse of politics even today, because we are epistemologically colonized by Western ideas. But final point, interpret tradition this way. For me, tradition is people's culture, people's ways, way of life that has roots in history. It is rooted in the historical experience of people, but it is dynamic, it changes. When I talk about Ethiopian traditions, I'm not talking about the remote past, going into the past. That is what I mean the dif uh, by the difference between traditionalism and globalism. Ethiopians are either globalist or traditionalist in their sense. Traditionalism means you imagine Ethiopian tradition as barbaric or primitive or as beautiful because Homer write about it, because Bob Marley was singing about it. So it is so nice. Without relating to the content, you romanticize what others said. Or, to call it barbaric is, oh, Ethiopians didn't really produce civilization. Our fathers were just fighting each other, you know? Someone wrote about Ethiopian history. The Ethiopian history is full of war and violence. The best example is the Menemes Ethiopian history, entire history is not the Menemes 
So when we understand tradition as something, if someone said tradition is the living phase of the dead, not the dead phase of the living. So if we understand tradition in that way, then our concern will be to talk to the people, to understand them and work. Thank you. Please. Some people who do not get jobs, mm -hmm. but also here in Germany, look, there are so many jobless people in any country mm -hmm. with any element of free market. Uh, you will have the same. Mm -hmm. You will have mm -hmm. the same. You will have those who lose uh, all these diplomas. You will, do, you will have those who win. Yeah. So in, in this way, education is not the door to the paradise. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, uh, maybe maybe call it one more, okay. and then uh, it was my that. Mm -hmm. okay. I, I have a short question. Because uh, you mentioned some epistemological principles, and you mentioned, I think, three, but I have I got only one, hetena, mm -hmm. humbleness. But I wanted to ask you whether it is actually an epistemological principle or either axiological principle. That is, whether you, you are clear about what belongs to the epistemology or axiology, or maybe they, they they overlap together, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because also, but it is about education. What kind of um, person we want to to leave the school? And one more question. So, how it happened that actually in the um, Ethiopian curricula there is nothing about Ethiopian culture and Ethiopian uh, literature? Who is responsible for that? Mm -hmm. You could be more explicit about this. Now okay. Let's, let's this and then we'll yes. One I'll, I'll try to be short. <laughs> it's also it's very complex. I'm really I really like all, <coughs> all of the questions and thank you for that. Um, realizing dreams through the Ethiopian education system, I absolutely agree that. I'm not sure I never dreamed this life, but I am very comfortable. I have a full time work in a university. I teach masters and PhD students, and I get paid very well in many folds than. Many Ethiopians could, I'm so happy. But imagine, when I go to university and when I study there, education was free. The poor people in Ethiopia paid for my education. Now, the question is should Ethiopians pay for, my, for education for someone like me to be successful? for someone who is not going to serve them using their own language, their own tradition. Look at the past history of Ethiopia in relation to education. What have we improved in relation to the, the lives of the people? You know Marisha? You know? If you go to 
Amnesty law or uh, anywhere in university, the first uh, education is the first thing in, about education is to improve your own way of living and doing things. The subject of the target, the objective of education, is not really based on the experience. Like when I'm, when I'm saying, I'm not saying that individuals cannot succeed. If I, if that was not possible, then there is no elitism. Then everything will become doomed. There are always elites, few elites that could succeed. But because we are human beings, we have also the capacity to decolonize ourselves, to struggle with our own privilege. Simply because I am privileged and I got, I become successful. For myself, doesn't mean that everything I know is something that's related to the people's daily life and improve them. My country people, the Lalibala people that I grew up with, the rural people, if whenever I go, you know, I, I understand what type of life they are living. So I, I don't agree that the dream of the people is not part of our dream. Individuals, yes. Again, it is against the world. Yes, it's against the world. We live in a colonized world, epistemologically. We live under the colonial knowledge-based domination of Euro-American ideas. It is very hard for an African, you know, well, uh, 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 now, rural people want Western education. That is a very good point. Yes, I agree, they want. You see, if you read Ranger's book, uh, uh, article and book uh, about colonial education in, in Kenya, when they went and teach them first there was resistance to study English. Once the institutions already accept those who are educated through the system, people were really fighting against each other to study English because that is the only path towards the system. So, because Ethiopian traditional institutions are not studied, are part of the system, because we are able to create some colonial people without really knowing much about Ethiopia to, and to become and educate Ethiopians about their own experience, that is not progress. Language is not relevant. I totally disagree. Language is a god that hides us in human flesh. We create, we're talking about big, many things using language. We represent reality using language. We can agree to do something using language. You take away the language of a people, you take away their identity, their capacity, their agency. Language is crucial. That is why a lot of countries are struggling against the dominance of English in the world. Last week, I was with Robert Philipson, who wrote about linguistic imperialism, and his wife, Tova, who wrote about linguistic genocide. Their work is a clear example of what's happening in the world. As long as we create a system that allows few individuals like myself to become knowledgeable without relevant experience in the real world, as long as we, be, we you know, exalt people without participating in the experience to become educators of those who are there, we are still in the business of colonialism. That is why I think uh, we, need, we need to decolonize that. To come to your question with the relevant metaphysical, I think that is more of rhetorical because uh, I understand the difference between uh, metaphysics, axiology, ontology, and, and epistemology. Uh, I would argue if it is even metaphysical. Now, no, 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 no. No, tetenna, tetenna, tetenna. When I say uh, as as something that guides the interpretation of reality, right? Mm -hmm. Axiology is at, about values. When you talk it about value, I don't agree that values are internal. That's why I don't use axiology. When we think values are internal to the person, not external out there in the world, you know, we take away agency from the world outside of us. That's a critic of, uh, if you are interested in philosophy, you can, you can uh, refer to Akhil Bilgrami's work on the critic of Western values. But it, it has gone above that. It, it has become part of the met met metaphysical reality. Western knowledge has become like a metaphysics. And the same way people used to believe in God. There is that metaphysical reality that people believe that Western knowledge is the only way. That's why rural people may accept you, because that's the reality that they see. But it doesn't necessarily make it right. Finally, uh, nothing Ethiopian Oh, who is responsible? We are responsible. I am responsible. Our knowledge, our way of thinking, our way of seeing ourselves as knowledge givers of those people who have their experience. When I interpret your experience according to my education, how would you feel? If I were to tell what you feel, what you think, what you do in relation to your own private life, 
without knowing you, but by studying certain texts. What would you feel if we are forced to study your own country in Ethiopian language in Amharic? What if German government changes the entire education system into Amharic? But do you, but do you study Amharic texts in English? No, no, no. No, because the, the, you, you, you what talk I'm about saying is, uh, Ethiopian uh, lit culture and literature. This was your, your words. Yeah. And it's I, in English. Yes, it's in English, and mm. so that means that you study English te uh, Amharic texts in English. And also, no. you have. Uh, no, no, no. Yeah. When you go to university, no, because or you ask me now no, no, whether, no. whether I whether no, no. I learn what English. What would you feel? What would you feel means if you were, yeah. if the government was to change the policy, and mm -hmm. Germans love their language, their culture, yeah? like Ethiopians do. Now the government decides, look, China is going to be successful. Let's change the entire education system in high school and university into Mandarin, Chinese. By the way, here mm -hmm. almost no, no Germans. Yeah. <laughs> oh, example, because I'm in Germany. I'm speaking the country, but I know all of you. Yeah, I, I'm Australian as well, <laughs> in that sense. So I'm just giving you an example. What do you think? That is the worst form of violence. The fact is that we don't question that. The fact is that we don't question that is so incredibly surprising because we are part of that system that gives us privilege. Because of that language, we sit on a pinnacle of knowledge and we become educators. Of course, it becomes also part of our daily life. But my challenge is we can change that. We can choose to stand with the people and be part of that. Ethiopian studies has produced so much knowledge about Ethiopia. It is an important element. It's not a final conclusion, I don't agree that, but it is an important element in trying to understand Ethiopia from various perspectives. We can use it as a starting point of dialogue, not as a final product that has to be accepted as it is. You can raise your hand, please. No, no. Yeah, it's not so true. It was a comment. I have some comments also, so I have no to thank. So I was struck by the word alienation, which you used in the beginning of your presentation. This reminded me of an intellectual who who was actually an international figure, but I don't know how far it's known, Pier Paolo Pasolini. I don't know if you ever heard about him, but exactly what he realized uh, was the degradation, exactly the alienation of, uh, let's say, peripheral urban people in the 60s and 70s, uh, in Italy in this case, which mm -hmm. was his country. And he built up a theory about that. And, and this also motivated his enormous interest for the so-called third world countries. He was many times uh, in Eritrea as well as in Ethiopia, where also he uh, act, uh, worked as uh, a movie director. Uh, and uh, he has got a lot of, and I think it would be interesting uh, for you to have a look at what I he wrote would. about this, because uh, there is some point. But this will bring us again to the point that your present is like our past. Mm, mm, <laughs> because mm. this was in Europe in the 60s mm. and 70s, and there was this process of alienation, which is exactly what you are uh, we, we, what you're realizing now. So I think this is a point uh, which raises some challenges. Mm -hmm. But in fact, I think this must be true because I think, as Dennis has said, we there are many aspects which you have mentioned which actually can can definitely be explained with the process of, uh, let's say, uh, dominating capitalism and globalization and alienation and free market and so on. So this has carried out a process of exploitation which is not. Uh, for some aspects, an exclusive aspect of uh, your country, but it's common now to the entire world. So we, we must be aware of this, and mm. one should uh, try to, let's say, uh, to, to look at this phenomenon as clearly as possible in order to distinguish which is proper and which is just uh, the output of, of the global movement. Then I have a, a, one, a couple of more remarks, and one is uh, concerning uh, the, uh, let's say, um, the view you have of Oriental studies, uh, and uh, you, you, you have more or less implicitly stated that you have a Saidian view. So Orientalists are people who didn't know anything about the country, they wanted just to impose their own views. I would say, particularly for Ethiopian studies, if you look at some, uh, the situation is not so simple. And I think we cannot simplify this uh, in this way, because uh, uh, there were many figures who actually you can take it uh, from whatever point you want, but uh, they, they knew very well the language of the country they were going uh, to study. They, they knew the culture, and uh, well, this was also acknowledged by, by the Ethiopians in many cases. So I think one has to, one has to distinguish and care carefully. 
And one last remark I have is this idea, so I would like to know in your perspective, which is the role which is assigned to the historical development. Mm -hmm. Because we, you talk of Ethiopians as a sort of historical entity. But here, so we study, uh, from Daniel's point of view, let's say the pre-Christian times, then uh, the, 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 the so-called Aksumite times, the medieval times, which, uh, when Ethiopia was quite different from what uh, has become, of course, uh, in the eventual. So, which is your understanding of this, of this historical dynamic? Do you accept them? Do you accept that there might be also a present uh, that does not understand or is not aware of what uh, uh, has happened before, in the sense that he has its own understanding now? But let's say someone who was a contemporary, let's say, of Zara Yaakov or even of Caleb, might have a completely different understanding of, of uh, uh, the people, the culture, and so on. So, uh, should we uh, uh, should we proceed in a historical way or how? Mm. Thank you so much. These are important uh, uh, and uh, important questions. I may not be able to answer them fully, but I will try. <laughs> alienation has been used. Yes, um, alienation has been used in very in, in, in various literatures. And to be honest, when I try to apply the word alienation, because not just alienation, every language that I used in English is you know. Uh, already uh, a language that has its own meaning in different epistemological locations. Uh, so alienation has been used in several times by different scholars, and uh, it has become so many things uh, in Western and psychological studies, especially uh, alienation has been used in many times. And one of the important characteristics that I want to emphasize is when we take away from the person, or when we take away the community from the person, that sense of disconnection that is created on the basis of indoctrinated ideas or knowledges. And that makes that person vulnerable and open for you know, many things. So I don't have a problem to take it from Italian, from anywhere in the world, as long as it does the interpretation. You know, my approach is not necessarily to say that there is a clear divide on the basis of knowledge between West, East, South, and so on. Knowledge. Epistemologist Ethiopian, you can see my book. I talked about Tirgwami as an Ethiopian methodology of interpreting knowledge. I took, for example, the example of uh, uh, Zena Skander study, for example. You can see how Skander says, imagine the Ethiopian tradition as a person who renounced uh, what he did. You know, he met his father, he didn't kill his father according to Ethiopian texts. He um, Slept with his mother, he didn't have intercourse with her. He held her as a mother. And he told her that he was his son. I, I'm not repeating the story because I, I'm assuming that you know the story. Maybe, do you know the story? Because that is, a, I don't know if everyone knows the story. So, it's, 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 not, it's not much important. But what I'm trying to say. Secundus. Yeah, secundus. So, what, 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 what is important about that story for me is how the Ethiopian interpreter introduced that knowledge, that idea, into Ethiopia by making it responsive to Ethiopia's cultural, traditional understandings. And hence, he wrote that maxims of, uh, the maxims that's written, he refused to speak, and so on. And compare that with how Sigmund Freud interpreted the Oedipus complex. That person is seen as an individual motivated by his own self-interest, who is a rebel of tyranny, and who killed his father, and, 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 and a kind of expression of the individual ego, or the individual sense of uh, uh, suppressed self. That are different interpretations. The source could be similar. Our interpretation, our way of interpreting a text determines. So my challenge is, the source of our interpretation should be rooted in Ethiopia. And then, we can interpret, we should really dialogue, incorporate, Knowledge is from all over the world, on the basis of what is important to the world, to Africa, but we have to really claim that agency. So alienation in others, we, I believe. Orientalism and the, you know, I appreciate is uh, Edward Said as a great scholar, and I don't believe that the world is divided between Orientalists and Occidentalists. I don't necessarily believe that people inhabit an ideology because of their skin color or because of where they come from. You can be anywhere in the world, and you can create a same epistemic community with Ethiopians. In my book, I make a clear distinction between epistemic location 
and epistemic, uh, epistemic location and social location. Socially, you can, we can come from the same country, but we can be against each other. See a lot of Ethiopians who were really interested in the colonization of Ethiopia. There are Ethiopians who wrote like that. There are Ethiopians who, who are part of this whole thing, who are responsible, as you said, we are responsible. But epistemic location is our way of interpreting and understanding Ethiopia. If we are rooted and become part of the people, we can become part of them, part of that Ethiopian way of interpreting the world, and we can become part of that. And the world requires Ethiopian unique way of interpreting the world so that we can have a diverse, pluriversalist world that has different knowledge. Otherwise, if we have one Western epistemology and interpret everything else, regimentizing it against and under it, we, we, we harm the world, we harm ourselves, because those diverse knowledges will not have the chance to grow. So my challenge is, anyone, there are many Europeans, not only Europeans, other than other parts of the world who came, lived in the country, my own great teacher, Klaus Sander, which, 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 which I studied under him when I studied logic in Ethiopia. He interpreted a lot of Ethiopian philosophy. We may not agree on everything. I don't expect all Ethiopians to agree on this. I wouldn't, I wouldn't take him as a model. Huh? I wouldn't take him as a model. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you may not take him even as a model, but have learned something about him, but from, from him. He may not have the language, I understand as a language. Where well, I happen to know him. So, so yeah, no problem. Person. I understand. I understand that again. But what I'm trying to say is, it is how we think and what we do that make us Ethiopians. If you want, you can become Ethiopian in terms of epistemology, in terms of axiology, in terms of that. So it is important to give chance to cultivate that Ethiopian epistemology, not stifle it with the West. That's what. Zarayakov is an example. An example. A lot of scholars love Zarayakov because he looks like Descartes, not because he is really a manifestation of Ethiopian understanding of philosophy. There were many, many philosophers before Zarayakov, and also after Zarayakov, but real study has been done in relation to that. Just to be clear, we're not talking about the field, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the uh, philosopher. Yeah. The, the philosopher Zarayakov I'm talking about, I thought that is an understanding. Of course, the king also was an important figure, uh, or the philosopher. So that, that also tells us that because we are interested, because we have Western epistemology, when we find something that looks like Western, yeah, Ethiopia had also philosophy, look at Zarayakov. That is unfortunately very reductionist. There is actually a new article this week on Zereyako yeah. and how he resembles Descartes and all of that. Yeah. Yeah, this came out. <laughs> yes. And, and, and the fact of the matter is Descartes, Descartes' philosophy, that might be a, a totally different area, is one of the problems that we are grappling with. This idea that what we imagine in our head is more important than the world itself. He started by doubting everything and he believed his idea, I think, in his mind. The mind, the thinking mind, becomes superior than the outside world. The trees, people who have traditional beliefs, for example, like the Gada, the Recha. No, the mind is elevated so that Westerners picked up him because without knowing, having experience, by believing, by having experience, you can create a reality that would allow you to do something in the world. That is a type of colonial knowledge that's been imposed on modernity, on Western modernity, which has been universalized through education. Also, way of the questions related to Zara Yaakov because some people have contested. That yes, is, yes, of, 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 of course, of course. Of course, of course. Of course. Uh, some of them will say, oh, by the way, he, yeah. he's, he can't be Ethiopian. So, well, I think, I don't think that's. Uh, who, uh, there was Yeke, and, uh, but there is Nafisa. Uh, okay, we can collect first uh, and then. So I would suggest uh, maybe here yeah, yeah, because he has waited and then yeah, the pizza yeah, and then also. Yeah. Okay, I just, just very, very. My question is about the title of the book, uh, oh. which in German I would say we, we have here uh, gewaltig, gewaltig. Uh, that's a very, very uh, uh, yeah uh, title because the alienation is very good. I I I, I agree with that uh, because the so-called Ethiopian elite. They are alienated from their culture, from their identity, from their history, from their language. They are sending their children to British school, to French school, hmm. completely. 
And uh, the title is, is very, very difficult for me. Uh, I appreciate very much your argument. Uh, I read some of uh, your articles and interviews also listened to. What, what will happen if you go to Ethiopia and now we have more than 35 universities? If you go and present this, this project, yeah. huh? what will happen? That's one. And the other is I'd like to, to know more about uh, Asra Sieniso and Kaddus uh, Abraham, uh, Zamanfas Kaddus Abraham. There are also two Ethiopian great thinkers, very much appreciated in in history, in language, uh, literature, and identity. Let, let, let's connect a couple of more questions. So, sure. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you uh, mentioned uh, today in your presentation and you stressed in your book that Kepler and Agest somehow constitute the identity of Ethiopians and how you would um, interpret, how would you prove it for the course of, for the course of history? Of course, now maybe you, or, Starting from the 19th century, yes, but how, how do you transpose it for the Ethiopian past? Yeah. And um, just because uh, you are from Lalibela, of course, and I, I suppose that you read Gerna Lalibela, and there is no idea of uh, the land. There is, a, you quote it that Ethiopians are the new Israel, but there is no idea land of the covenant. There is no such an idea. Maybe we would. Center and prefer. And then we said that that means like how this there are some people or some group of people who think that the, the central Ethiopia colonized the yeah. prefer Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. And how do you uh, see that? And if you see student education and, and also 1970s rise of this, why you couldn't say like the earlier, little bit earlier? the violence against the tradition and the local culture start even earlier and then against the prefer society or the, 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 it's the center to the uh, prefer location. Mm -hmm. Can I respond to this? Yeah, okay. Okay. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to be short. Uh, Gewaltink, is that the yeah, word? Gewaltink, violence. I don't know what it is, but that could be good. Uh, look, you know, at the end of the day, I have to write it in a language where I am uh, and I understand there might be problems in relation to the language. But I emphasize on colonialism, as I said, because colonialism usually is understood in simply by colonization coming, Western, Westerners coming and dominating there. I'm trying to emphasize that it can be created within the country. And elites, by internalizing that knowledge, because it gives them privilege and power by linking them to the West, they created a system that suppresses invalidates the experience of their own people. That is why I want to bring Ethiopia's experience, not a unique case, uh, 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 sorry, I'm <laughs> forgetting his real name. Uh, yes, yes. So it is not unique to Ethiopia, it is also global. Mm. So that we find a way to talk about this in relation to other countries, Latin American experiences, uh, other African country experiences, Asian experiences, quite similar, because the domination of knowledge has not been critically engaged. And in that respect, I really appreciate a lot of knowledge Ethiopian studies has produced. We can use that to show some of the, the ecology of epistemologies that existed in Ethiopia, uh, if we are able to, send, to kind of develop that together of, on the base of Ethiopia. And I think there are also uh, great texts that are produced. And I must also emphasize that I haven't read everything Ethiopian studies produced, really. And I could be ignorant uh, in some of my criticisms. But, on the basis of what I understand, some of these prominent uh, ideas probably need to be submitted or subjected to dialogue and, and, and so that they become part of the people's daily discourse. You know, some of these ideas, for example, Ethiopia's origin of Semiticism or Semitization. I have never heard this from the village. I've never heard it. It's not part of our tradition. 
nobody knows that. It's, a, it's an ideology that's imposed upon that. that so these things need to be advanced. But as I say this, I really recommend for all of us to read his text. I, I have types to use in my book, as I say so. That's a very good text. Uh, it talks about, it doesn't talk about yes. same, the Semitic origin of Ethiopia. It talks about Ethiopia's connection with Kush uh, and how this was spoken like that. We may not go back to the past. You know, one of the, one of the interesting things is sometimes people reduce Ethiopian history as a myth when it becomes a strong. But even if it is myth, they want to relate it also to that external influence. And so uh, it's very important to critically look at that. Uh, so Assassinus was a very good source. And a lot of people don't pick that source because it doesn't go with this ideology that they have about Semitic origin of Ethiopia and, and, and other ideas. And Nafiza's question of the Kubra Negus is not mentioned. Uh, Kubra Negus as a cakeist was produced at some time in history. What is important about the Kubra Negus is not the book. It is a culture. What the Kubra Negus talks about is Ark of the Covenant. And, and, and that represents Ethiopia. It's written there in Ethiopia as... Ethiopia being a country that inhabits the presence of God. Naibara is purely created partly on that basis. The naming of Naibara, some of the ideas in Naibara are created. I have mentioned even in Giz uh, from it, uh, which says Ante Musa Kubrani. I have mentioned when I talk about center, I have mentioned how uh, Ethiopia is referred to as the New Jerusalem. Now, the important thing is not that for me. The important thing is how people believe that they live in a chosen nation, not in the same way by referring to the Quran as a Bible or as, um, as something that is always available to the people, but as a culture. We don't find anywhere in the world in the same way Ethiopia has had the replica of the Ark of the Covenant, the Tabot. The Tabot in every village represents the center of that village, that people go together, get together, and do things around that. That is why Ethiopians, uh, 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 the Kubernetes story, brings out, somehow explains these things, which is in the culture. The source is the culture, not the book. But I refer to the book as an important text. Now, someone who doesn't agree with that, with the Western epistemology, may come tomorrow and say that, look, Actually, Kubernetes is not Ethiopian. It is a Saba or an external doctrine. There is very little to say against that type of that, that type of scandalous conclusion, because we haven't really framed and developed Ethiopian culture and its text together. We just gave the examples, the texts to others to interpret in their own way. So we have to be really careful that we connect the text with the culture of the people. And the last one, Southern, Southern Nations. Peripheries. Oh, sorry. The peripheries. Yes, yes, it's, it's a very important point. It's a very important point. There are arguments in the book how uh, expansions were made, how conquests were made, how violence is committed. There's no denial about that. But, but I want to emphasize that the source of my book does not take into account everything in Ethiopia. That would be unrealistic to realize in one book. I am epistemologically tried my best to be located in a place where I study. As far as I understand Ethiopia from the place where I study this about this book, Ethiopia resembles this. This is not a final product for what Ethiopia was, or is, or should be. This is a basis that decolonize that, that tries to criticize to criticize the existing framework that forces us to read, to interpret Ethiopian experience based on Western epistemology. Let's avoid that and start to dialogue about Ethiopia. Let's talk about the Gada system. I really am fascinated about that. I have mentioned in my book saying the limitation of the book that I haven't had the chance to incorporate other ideas. And when we do that, I don't expect coherence. There could be conflict, contradiction. And the text is not the final book upon which or on the basis of which Ethiopia should live. It should be a starting point of dialogue about the relevance of the Western knowledge.
Before 1974 or after 1974, there are so many. I, it's really difficult to, stand, to argue on the basis of historical realities. Uh, uh, there are so many things that have been manufactured, that are also not yet told, and uh, uh, it's possible uh, to really bring that into dialogue. But the most important point is, Western epistemology that tell us about colonialism, about domination, and so on, may not be helpful unless first we address the question of epistemic and structural domination that we are living under. As long as we are under there, we we'll never find a place to meet and have dialogue. So, um, my question, Yirgayi, is... Um, I understand the point that you're looking at it, uh, the, the agency of Ethiopians in native colonization and all of that. But one of the things I think is missing is how, for example, while looking at the church education system, how do church scholars then react to this? Uh, we're talking about the agency of the people, but I think we have disregarded the agency of uh, those in charge of the education system, the traditional education system that you speak of. Yeah. What were their roles? Um, were there any negotiations? Did they write against such uh, ideas? Mm -hmm. Were they fighting for the continuation of the education system? Mm -hmm. that is, that's one question I have. And let's go back for more. <coughs> uh, this is a completely different matter. But uh, I'm, I'm uh, not very pleased about your comment about missionaries. I don't know what kind of missionaries you, you meant, uh, from which century, or from which background. Of course, they are all uh, somewhere bound in their background. But, but uh, if, you, if you would talk about modern missionaries, then you, you should know how much they have uh, contributed for, for languages, translating the Bible. And, and other books, or how much they have uh, done uh, school materials in different languages, or, or talked about equality of people in, in front of God and in front of other people. Of course, they, they fight against uh, certain traditions, I mean bad traditions, say like, like the problems of, of women and such things. So uh, there are many things you should see positive. Yes. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, can I start with the missionaries? Okay. Uh, yes, I, I agree. I, I really struggle a little bit. In first first place, I didn't talk about missionaries. When I mentioned missionaries, I was talking about I was theorizing finding a language to express the identity of Ethiopians who internalize Western knowledge and think that they were educators, modernizers of their own people. I gave them two identities. One is a type of a missionary identity where they would go out to preach. The gospel of Western knowledge to their own people. Yeah, but that's a very old-fashioned way of thinking. Uh, okay, but, I'm, I'm ref but, but, but another is mission. But to come back to the role of missionaries, there are studies, accounts of studies. It's not possible to universalize everything, but as much as missionaries might have done good things, they have done, they have done I think, unintentionally, possibly, also unhelpful and productive things. When we talk about, uh, we don't really... We are not against Western uh, local culture, but uh, we want to avoid bad things in the culture. It reminds me Don Richardson saying in West Papua New Guinea when he talked about the role of missionaries. We are out there to eliminate barbarism, to eliminate cannibalism. Uh, this ascription of uh, names to the practice of the culture on the basis of the experience of the people who talk about it. On the, based on the experience or the understanding of them in the Bible, in their own book, that is oppressive. And the missionaries are, have unfortunately contributed to a large extent for the acceptance of Western epistemology in many parts of Africa. There are countless evidences that we can mention. So we cannot say all of them are like that, but because they, they say we, they want to mediate between the colonizers who would go and violently crush and the local people to meet together by changing them and accepting the authority of the colonized. One of the insidious effects of colonialism was actually realized through missionary work. Uh, and coming to Kewan's uh, um, uh, question, which is a very important question, look, I'm not saying that anyone, myself, or anybody is the savior of Ethiopia. I don't think there is a, a product of knowledge, be it in the church, or somewhere hidden to be discovered and applied in the country. 
These are all parts of our history, our culture, our experience. Some of them may contradict each other. Some of them may work together. But we need to interpret them on the basis of our realities in the world. So, uh, on, on that note, church traditions have, fortunately, because when the system really uh, leave everything out, like the, you know, yeah, as, uh, uh, they are this dichotomy. The Tlapsigawi means uh, the knowledge that has been prevalent in Ethiopia. Yeah, with them. Tlapsigawi means the spiritual knowledge. The spiritual knowledge is very much intact or very much as available in the texts in various areas, including Ethiopian states and others. And those are resources that still can be used. But it doesn't mean that everything is there. I'm not saying the church, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, is the savior, or there's a knowledge there we can apply it there, and so on. But it's an important element. There are others we can we can also study the Gada system, the consuls, uh, you know, all other ethnic groups that we have in Ethiopia. But it has to be on the basis of their experience. And then the final outcome is to have dialogue on that. So church scholars might be important, and we must understand that the church has had also is not neutral from this domination of Western epistemology. I would even argue that the ways in which some of the church scholars are trained in Addis in Addis Ababa uh, are very much exposed to the Western uh, uh, philosophy and knowledge uh, rather than uh, the internal Ethiopian philosophy. Because of course, there is a Tuwami, there is a Zemari, they, they learn them, those traditions. But in relation to these epistemological principles that guide those knowledges, there's a lot of discussion that involves enlightenment thinking, philosophy, and so on. So there's a tendency to make in the Ethiopian church a modern uh, church and present it in the world, not on the basis of the local cultural resource understanding of the people in the villages. Ethiopian traditional schools still work on food. Islamic schools. And Islamic schools, they are beggars. Most of them, they have to beg in order to uh, educate because the Western system, the entire system that we have, can you imagine, doesn't regard that their education as education. So when education for all is declared, Ethiopian scholars still exist in the villages. Kids still go and study, but the teachers are not regarded as teachers. You know? And students who go to the traditional schools, that education is not regarded as a human right. Only Western education is a human right. Concerning you, you have mentioned this question, for example, of the Semitic origin, which uh, is uh, not in keeping, so to say, with the self-understanding of the people, and to some extent it, it is more or less not acceptable. So, in the ideal reform that you support, you would you wouldn't stress this aspect. But I, I, I wonder then, how do you look at the linguistic, uh, let's say, study in general? If you do not accept that their languages are related, but of course. Uh, language uh, is one point, and there, there are uh, ethnic identities, uh, and, and so on. I think this is a complex dynamics which is commonly accepted. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we go along the way of, uh, let's say, of uh, uh, being, uh, um, let's say, prone towards uh, the self-understanding of the people, then uh, there, is a, there is so much that uh, could damage, I would say, the people themselves. Mm -hmm. Think, for example, of, of uh, let's say, of health education. Uh, are you still uh, in favor, let's say, of uh, the, the traditional view of, uh, let's say, of supporting uh, uh, so the understanding of disease uh, as uh, it was historically understood? Or do you think that we should take, let's say, measures which are supported by science? So, and so the, the same can be applied to many other uh, fields. So which is the limit, actually, of mm -hmm. your looking at uh, your education? Mm -hmm. And in connection to this, you, you, you have mentioned as the na as one of the, but I, just to take it as a provocative example. So, in a Netanyahu, which was implanted by Menelik uh, in his Gebar system, how much the was there mm -hmm. uh, in his attitude towards uh, the people he was going to exploit? Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I think these are, these are important questions. The Semitic origin of Ethiopian civilization is something that we probably need uh, to discuss it in another time. I wouldn't really go in deeply into it, but I can say a few things. Look, you mentioned, uh, with Geke, you mentioned Alakasar Seriso. That is an Ethiopian scholar that takes a thesis, and he talks about the Ethiopian origin of civilization. 
At least we have comparable texts which say that the Ethiopian origin of civilization is not semantic. Ethiopia did, was not after others who, who came and civilized it, give it a language, a letter, or cultivation, they taught them and so on. Ethiopia is actually the origin of these things. And its territory expands to places including Yemen and so on. At least we have contestable texts that are left out of the mainstream that understands Ethiopia as an extension of uh, uh, that thesis. And of course, there is a whole range of questions. For example, ethnic identities, language, look. Some, some people say, oh, you look like more of Arabs. You know, you don't look, you don't have a Negroid feature and so on. Go to the Fulanis in Cameroon. You find exactly people like us. Go to Rwanda. You find people like us. You know, there is no as such a strict demarcation of racial and so on things that would make us extensions of those. And the question is, why would we make those above us before us? Why can't we become, if that is possible, that the, probably also they also went from us. But I think partly this is because this general, it could be my argument, but my understanding, my argument is that this general understanding that to Africa, knowledge, literature, civilization flows toward East Africa, not from Africa towards the rest of the world. That is an established epistemology, belief, ideology. You know, one of the things how this ideology is constructed is not simply by believing there are, of course, evidences that can be produced. You see, history is like an ocean. It is vast enough to find anything to construct the mental image that you have about the past. The reason why we so much understand about history as war is because we, we are selective in terms of bringing those stories. So our framework of understanding history allows us to choose events that are not connected with each other, but we interconnect them to produce a narrative that tells us about the past as being uh, a history of the past. The next idea has a good bar system and the violence in Ethiopia. I, there has been a lot of violence in Ethiopia. And I'm not saying Ethiopian tradition was humility and no violence. That, that, that would be, that would be uh, a complete uh, uh, wrong. There has always been, uh, in one way or another, violence happening in the country. Uh, so I'm not trying to exonerate past actors. I'm not saying mainly because the Holy Man, he didn't commit that violence. Or I'm not, but the reason why we emphasize on a specific historical persons in history has a reason in our desire, in our political desire for the present. Why we emphasize so much about certain personalities in the past is not because they are the only realities of the past, they are not the only past makers. We know Ethiopian kings who used to go to many parts of the world, even in, in, in La Libera, people say La Libera gave the name. La Libera to Kenya, the area of Kenya. Kenya means, uh, you know, wisdom or white people. I'm not saying that is a real one, but people even have many interpretations that they give. So what I'm trying to say is, I'm not trying to say that the past was peaceful, that there was no violence against uh, periphery people or center and periphery. So I'm not saying that. But the selection of history is really a political act. Because you cannot really describe history as it is. We become selective because of our epistemology, because of our ideology. The Western epistemology ideology makes us select history that correspond, incorporate Ethiopia as subservient to the West. And political understandings within the country also make us select certain histories that would fit into the present ideologies of the states. So it's open. Maybe last two questions because it's very late. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'll, 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 please. Uh, uh, one, two, three, four, but uh, <laughs> let's yeah. try to be very short because it's already almost six o'clock. I think I have said everything. I don't have much to say, so <laughs> I'll be short. Very short. Very short. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, you did not, I think you didn't jump or you overlooked the Gideon's question. What would the reaction would be now? Oh. European oh. <laughs> because it's important now uh, we are struggling with. How should the nation building looks like? Yeah. And this 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 question has this your your work has a big part mm -hmm. to play. How we construct ourselves, how we build ourselves, 
how should the UK look like uh, comparing those uh, different uh, parts of history. The, uh, you can put different frameworks or time remarks in the UKC. So what would be your reaction to that? Mm -hmm. How can we go through it? Okay, one more and then answer and then the last two ones, yeah. please. Um, you said that there are some texts. Um, you also mentioned some, I think, some Aleka. I didn't understand his name. Yeah, Asras. Asras. And, okay, and um, you said, I think, that these texts, some of them refer to a mo model a concept that yeah. uh, think that does not originate from Semitic uh, origin. Mm -hmm. So, uh, my question is uh, these texts. Are they uh, produced recently? Are they produced uh, on the base of oral literature, or are these manuscripts, or even inscriptions, or what are these texts? Yeah, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, I think Gete knows when Alec Asrasenas might have made these texts. It's an old text that has been produced in in uh, uh, Aksum by this Alec, mm -hmm. and on top of that, we refer to a lot of uh, texts in the past in the Gete literature. I haven't seen. If there is, you can tell me, I haven't seen any Ethiopian scholar in the past who was so forgetful of their ancestors who came from Semites, who didn't have a nostalgia. Look, our ancestors came from the Semitic South Arabia, and they taught us how to speak, how to write. They gave us goods. How can, if that was true, how can Ethiopians become so scandalous and forgetful of their ancestors? It's only the Europeans who are reminding them. See. So the, the ex existence or non-existence of that culture within the country is one important source to question that this is a foreign ideology that resonates with, with the Western thesis of the origin of civilization. Um, reaction now, I really do not, I, I, I haven't written a timeless text. You know, I don't know how would the reaction be. I wouldn't write by taking into account what people would feel. To be honest, when I talk to you now, I talk to you from my heart. Mm. I wouldn't know how you will re react to what I say. But on the basis of that, we can start a dialogue. And I think Ethiopia's conflict is very difficult now. What's happening is so traumatizing that it's very difficult to create a kind of understanding between people. They're so entrenching, entrenching in their own understanding of what should be done. That is where, look, our ancestors lived together, fought foreign invaders lived together even if there were problems. At least they existed. At least they ate. They produced things together. And we should be able to understand what makes them, what helps them do that. Unfortunately, we don't find that answer in Western texts. We have to find it ourselves among our people. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I my comment, oh, it's not more of a question, it's more of an, a comment. Uh, it's that um, I was a teacher uh, back home. I, I used to teach high school students. I was a math teacher. And usually the, the school directors would come and, you know, like, see how, how I'm teaching. And I would usually use Amharic as my medium of instruction. Mm -hmm. So all the terms I would use are English terms, but I still use Amharic. And they would tell me, why are you doing this? Uh, it's uh, an international school. But most of the students, all of the students are Ethiopians. So I would be like, it's math. It, it's in English. It's, you know, it, it's already hard enough to make it even more harder, which is, um, which is kind of hard. So um, now my point is that um, people would understand things so easily when it's in their language. Now, I'm not saying I'm hiring it only. Mm -hmm. I'm saying in every language, it's very important that people have it presented to them in their own language. It is very important. Um, but it is also important to, to remember that we need to have something that will unify us. Yeah. Not just Ethiopian-wise, but world-wise. That will make us global people. And so we have to make this balance between uh, going to our own and being global. Um, so yeah, that's the yeah. <laughs> uh, I know you're lawyers and you, you said no. So, uh, so I'm, I was thinking when you talk about Ethiopia, like for comparison, Korea, Japan, and China, 
how they copied uh, or how they they copy the law, but they keep their own identity, culture, and the, the, the like everything. And the, and when I see it as not colonized, but we were voluntarily like you know, and voluntarily adopt the system for nobody has forced us to adopt. And I mean, that our forefathers were not defeated in this battle, but we were defeated on the knowledge. And I don't know how. And I'm looking forward to read the book, but how, what happened, why these people were defeated on the, on the mm -hmm. idealism. And, but we were not defeated on the, on the battle, but it's on idea. And now we, I think, when I, I'm, I'm, I'm start studying also law economics, I think, oh, this, it is copied voluntarily. And now in your book, and, and many times you said, violence against the, the tradition, violence against the local epistemology, and I, I'm curious what it is. Excellent. Very good questions. Um, balancing uh, the legacy, uh, but, you know, we, we don't need to be isolated from the world. That is uh, uh, a very familiar point. I, I, I really agree with everything that you say, but I want to stress something here. Uh, if we, I'm not saying that we should not, for example, study English. I'm not saying that foreign languages should not be part of our education. I'm not saying that. We need to communicate with the world. The world is becoming multilingual increasingly, although not all languages have equal uh, cultural capital or the capacity to exchange it opportunities. If I study German language and came here, it's not the same as you go to Ethiopia and study Ethiopian, because the Ethiopians would respect you more because you come with you know, with Western identities that they might think that you might open doors for you. So that cultural translatability may be something that to be questioned. But nonetheless, we really need languages. We should study English. What I'm saying is, it's not important to study everything in English. It's not even good for the world. It's not even good for the world because by eliminating the experience that is contained in the language, not just Amharic. I'm not saying Amharic only. You know, the question of what language to decide is something that should be given to the people. But it has to be given by making clear the ways in which linguistic imperialism, linguistic genocide, genocide against the people's knowledge is being, is being perpetuated all over the world against non-Western people especially. So, yes, we can have a foreign education like other countries have. You know, most of you understand... Um, we understand foreign languages, we should study English departments, they should be there. But why should I study civics, history, geography, sports, everything in English? By a person who doesn't understand English well. To serve people who don't have English in the first place. This is the mentality that we have. This is not voluntary only. You know? Yeah, it is not. It is not. I, I, I can come to the experience of Japan. I tried to look at Japan's education system. We have also what is known as a Japanization, a Japan. Yes, yes. Oh, okay. Uh, 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 yes, I chose. Yes, I chose. Yeah, Catherine yeah. Jackson. Yeah. Yeah. You see, one of the reasons, one of, one of, there are many historical reasons, like uh, Bahari Zaudi uh, also says, why the correlation of comparison with Japan may not be uh, really appropriate. But one of the things is in Japan, they had, for example, this philosophy called Nihon Jo. Japan's way of understanding reality in the world. If you read Lovkart uh, Yohan's interpretation of Japan, it clearly shows you how the Japan culture developed a kind of a world view that is used to interpret the world. In the 1860s, I think, the Japanese king came out with an edict called the Imperial uh, uh, Edict on Education. It's basically, in a simple term, it means that Japan is heart, European skill. That is your mission, go to the world, take your Japanese heart with you, try to bring what can help us to develop what we already have. So when the Japanese went to the world, they were clearly, clear, I'm not universalizing by the way, clear that they are going to bring something that could help what they already know. They never really changed their country's language. Ethiopians went out and were madly infatuating ways, Marx and Leninism. They believed that they have to get rid of everything in tradition, including the emperor, in order to start as a new Ethiopia. 
So most of them study Marxism, Leninism. Most of them went to political schools. There are other factors, of course. So that is, that is an important point. Another important point is, you see, Africans, are, unfortunately, there's also geopolitics in the world, right? We are located within a world that is epistemically placed at the lower hierarchy of humanity. That black people need to be educated by the West. The systems and institutions that are created in the world that are there to civilize them. You see, when education was introduced in most parts of Africa, as I said before, there was this Africanization movement in Africa. They wanted, look, we've been colonized for a long time, but our children are graduating without knowing anything from the West. Now we have become free. Let's introduce our own languages. Let's Africanize the curriculum. Antanari was at the Saba conferences, the 1960s there was a conference about Africanizing the curriculum. And they went out to the world. They, their resources have been exploited, they haven't had anything to create their own education. So they went out, some of them, we will create African socialism, but we have to go and look for loans, money to lend from the you know, people. They brought money and, and, and resources, 70s, 60s, you know, the financial crisis that happened in the world, Africa was so much affected, and the World Bank came up with what is known as a structural adjustment program. What is the World Bank? The Western world pretty much demanded that you don't need big governments who would create institutions and so on. You need small governments and big societies. See? And when they implement structural adjustment program, African states went out of government. They no longer have the means to finance their own institutions. They told them, look, focus on lower education. Only distribute education to, up to year level four. Still now, this is education for all, is about, about you know, education is turning into a human rights. In other words, Western education is turning into a human right, not the people's culture, because they haven't had the chance to study into this. So we are located, in terms of this, we are located within that, within that history of Africa, where when they were coming and meeting in Addis Ababa, we were part of that meeting, trying to Africanize our curriculum. But it was very difficult because systematically, structurally, the world is regimented in that way. You will be ignored if you don't do that. So there are other, other reasons as well, with uh, the coming of Italians and the decimation of uh, Ethiopians who were educated. The Rauguel school that I tried to mention, uh, there was some movement in Ethiopia to bring Ethiopian away, and it was abandoned. And a great American advisor who came to the emperor told him, Ernest work. look, you have to Africanize, you have to, you have to Ethiopianize your curriculum, you have to use this. But Haile Selassie had also to, to take into account that Britain's desire over the country was so entrenched that they want to take over the country, and, he, and the world will not recognize you as a sovereign country unless you have Western frameworks. Until now, that is the case. So there is these pressures, these structural pressures that force the country to be part of this global empire of knowledge of uh, global capitalism. We have to stop here. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. So, <laughs> you, you receive many questions. Uh, uh, I'm so happy. Uh, Thank you. Uh, so much. I'm so sorry if I was rude in some ways. I said I'm oh. sorry. But, yes. Mm -hmm. What you said about this uh, Semitic, uh, Semitic um, background that uh, it's strange that there are no stories. But you know, I can say that my, 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 my grandmother has never told me a story about India, you know, that my ancestors come from, from, from India. So, why? It could be. I'm just saying. Yeah. 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 Thank <laughs> you.
ሴብላ ድርገው ሪኮርድ አድርገዋለሁ ከእንሶዬ ያወራል ግን ይርጋበ በደንብ